All right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, remember the rules. Clean up after you eat. Don't leave any greasy messes, otherwise like Joaquin is gonna come down with a hammer and, uh, and make you <laughs> do something unpleasant. <laughs> so uh, we are uh, very fortunate today to have uh, Sarah Simon from Fermilab to come and talk to us about uh, a very interesting experiment that uh, many of us are also involved in different aspects here at the University of Illinois. Uh, Sarah is going to talk about oh, CMB and hopefully, sorry, CMB and hopefully about CMB as four as well. A little bit, yeah. A little bit about that. <laughs> uh, so Sarah uh, got her undergraduate degree at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And then later she went and got her PhD in physics at Princeton, and you were working with Susan as well, Susan Stack. Uh, after that, uh, she uh, was a postdoc at the University of Michigan. Later, uh, uh, what is the name of those fellows? Uh, Wilson, you were a Wilson fellow, which is uh, the equivalent of an assistant tenure track assistant professorship at, the, at, at Fermilab. And now she's a staff scientist uh, at Fermilab, and she's involved in uh, Simon's Observatory as well, and the construction and the project of CMBS4. So thank you, Sarah, and please take it away. Great, thanks, really thanks. So the cosmic microwave background is the universe's oldest light. It's also the most prevalent. In fact, if you were to add up all the energy of all the photons in the universe, more than 90% of it would be from the CMB. And in fact, in, on average, in every cubic centimeter, there are about 400 photons from the CMB. So, we, since it formed uh, so early in the universe, we can use the CMB in two primary ways. The first is that it gives us a snapshot of the early universe, where conditions are, and energies are much higher than we could ever reach with uh, current terrestrial particle accelerators. So we get a snapshot of high energy physics and can probe the first moments of the universe by searching for inflationary signals. And then it also acts as a backlight to the formation and evolution of structure in the universe. And so we can use that to learn about things like dark matter, dark energy, and neutrinos. So uh, the measurements of the cosmic microwave background really continue to reveal a wealth of information about our universe. Uh, improved measurements will only expand our understanding of neutrinos, dark matter, dark energy, and cosmological models. Uh, future CMB projects like Simon's Observatory and CMBS4 are really going to revolutionize the field. We'll really start reaching critical thresholds on a lot of these quantities. But this really requires uh, bold steps in instrumental development. And this includes not only uh, novel technology development, but also in production, so you can scale up making 100 times more of, of these detector arrays than we've ever made before, and having uh, new methods for systematic control. Because as we become more sensitive, we also become more sensitive to systematics. So I'll walk us through uh, an example today um, in all of these areas for, for feed horns, which is an area of development that I work in. But the technologies that we're developing for CMB um, are actually opening new opportunities for scientific exploration in the millimeter regime as well. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, <clears throat> current Lambda CDM cosmology says we live in an expanding flat universe that began in a hot, dense state that our universe is dominated by dark matter and dark energy. And when we look at the history of the universe, it's a, really a story of expanding and cooling over time. So very early on, we have this hot plasma and that's oscillating over slight uh, densities in the early universe. So gravity's pulling things in, pressure is pushing things out. Eventually, we expand and cool enough that light can decouple um, from this plasma forming the cosmic microwave background. And when that light decouples, it carries information about all of those oscillations with it. And then we have a coalescing of matter into larger and larger structures over time. Now, when we look at the expansion rate of the universe, we see that it's accelerating. And so something has to be causing that acceleration. 
So we know that there has to be something like dark energy causing that. And if we look at the formation of structure today, it would have been much more slow without uh, dark matter. And so that's our big hint that, that dark matter um, is influencing our structure. Now, the lambda CDM model is, uh, describes our universe incredibly well and with only six parameters, but it really leaves many fundamental questions unanswered. And the CMB is one of the best ways we can answer these questions. So, you know, the leading theory of the early universe um, is inflation, um, saying that there was this exponential expansion in the first moments of the universe. And the CMB can directly measure the energy scale of inflation through this quantity R, the tensor to scalar ratio. So this is really one of the few and precious ways to probe the early universe around 10 to the negative 36 seconds after its beginning. We also know that there are um, three flavors of neutrinos that we know of, um, but we don't know that much about their masses yet. And so uh, we really, with the CMB, can measure the sum, total sum of the neutrino masses. And this is a really great complement to neutrino oscillation experiments that are measuring the differences in masses between different flavors of neutrinos. Now the CMB uh, also allows us to measure the number of relativistic species. We of course know there are those three flavors of neutrinos, but we can also see if there are particles beyond that model. So many different models constrain and, and uh, many different models uh, predict new light particles, things like axions. Um, and the CMB is a, a model independent way to actually constrain and probe theories that are predicting these new light particles. And finally, <clears throat> the CMB constrains dark matter and dark energy through the growth of structure, the expansion rate and the relative amounts of dark matter and dark energy in the universe. And so this is an extremely accurate probe of these really mysterious dark components and very complementary to supernova and large scale structure studies like those in the optical. So we get all the information from the CMB from measuring its temperature and polarization. And so you can see an example of the map of the sky here from Planck. So the, the different color variations show you different temperature perturbations and the, the patterns here are showing the polarization. We take these maps and we process them into temperature and polarization power spectra as well as maps of lensing and sources. And from these we extract our science, which is all those quantities I just told you about, as well as uh, information about astrophysical processes. So really, uh, this is the history kind of, of, of CMB experiments. We started out um, with only measuring the temperature of the CMB. We then moved on and, and added polarization. And since then, our detectors are photon noise limited. So the only way you gain in sensitivity is by adding more detectors. So the current generation has uh, scaled up to on order 10,000 detectors. Um, CSO uh, is actually um, just commissioning right now, so we, we're about here in the timeline, and it'll have over 60,000 detectors in its nominal configuration. And it's a really important stepping stone for future experiments like uh, CMBS4, which will have on order uh, 500,000 detectors coming uh, early in the 2030s, as well as uh, Lightbird, which is a future proposed satellite. So, you know, Simon's Observatory is really the only current project of its scale, and it's really an important step towards these future experiments. And we really stand to gain an amazing amount of scientific understanding from ESO itself, uh, but also from these future experiments. So, from our maps here, we create uh, these power spectra. So, just to orient people. Uh, this is the power, and then we take that power and we bin it up based on different angular size scales on the sky. So uh, we express those in spherical harmonic multiples. So uh, these are small angular scales, 
and these are our, our large angular scales. So taking a moment and just looking at the temperature spectrum here, um, you can see that there, there are a lot of features in here. And we've measured it incredibly well for a single model of the universe. And every feature here has information that we can extract. And so there's a lot of information to be gained from measuring the temperature better, even though it's already well characterized. So one example um, of areas we can improve in our measurements in CMB or CMB lensing. So here, uh, photons from the CMB are gravitationally deflected by the structure in our universe. And from that, we can actually reconstruct maps of the dark matter distribution. If I kind of toggle between these two slides, you can see the effect of, of no lensing and with lensing. And so it's a very small effect, but we've measured it incredibly well. Now, lensing, because you're mapping out uh, the structure of the universe, is probing the growth of structure, which is giving us information about where the dark matter is, as well as dark energy, and the sum of the mass of neutrinos. But to do better in these measurements, we need improved temperature and polarization measurements on small angular scales across large areas of the sky. Another area um, where we can improve are in galaxy cluster measurements via the sanyayev zeldovich effect. Here, your photon energy from the CMB is being boosted because it's scattering off of the high energy photons in galaxy clusters via inverse Compton scattering. So if we look at the CMB peak here at 150 gigahertz, we're actually missing energy because those photons have been boosted up by this hot gas to higher frequencies, higher energies. Now, galaxy clusters are the largest bound structures in the universe. And their mass profiles are really sensitive to the effects of dark matter and dark energy on structure formation. Um, it has a couple of advantages over other ways that we probe galaxy clusters. Um, the signal doesn't dim with distance because, again, we're using the CMB as a backlight. Uh, so we can get a more thorough picture of the evolution of these objects over time. And we also have increased sensitivity to these outskirts of clusters, because unlike things like X-ray, which scale with the density squared, um, this effect scales with just, a, with just the density. <clears throat> and that's really beneficial for uh, improved constraints on cluster astrophysics. So right now, these cluster mass estimates are, are currently limited at the, the 5 to 10% level. So there's a lot of uh, space to improve. Now, um, any light particles produced in the, that are produced would have been produced in large numbers uh, in the early universe. Um, those would come in here and uh, modify your radiation density. And so if your radiation density changes, that changes where some of the peaks and phases of this structure in your power spectra for the CMB are. And so um, we know the standard model right now is 3.043. That's the three neutrinos plus their interactions. And so if we want to look for particles beyond the standard model, we're looking for a change in this parameter. Now, uh, what the value of that is depends on the degrees of freedom in the particle you have, but kind of the smallest value you, you might expect is this 0 0.027. So currently, Planck gets uh, an uncertainty on this parameter of about 0.2. SO improves that uh, by about an order of magnitude. Uh, or half an order of magnitude. And then CMBS4 is actually reaching down to this level of 0.027. And I think the most exciting thing about this is it's a broad model independent search to discover or rule out new light relics. <clears throat> so moving on from the temperature to the polarization in the CMB, uh, the CMB is linearly polarized at decoupling through Thomson scattering. To get uh, linear polarization, you need to have a quadrupolar anisotropy. And you can get that in several different ways. You can have scalar or density perturbations, tensor or gravity wave perturbations, or vector or vorticity perturbations. And we don't expect to see these in our universe, so mostly we're, we're looking at scalar and tensor perturbations. And uh, if you look at the polarization patterns in the CMB, um, 
these source, these polarizations in different ways. Scalar perturbations can only create E modes, whereas tensor perturbations can create both E mode and B mode polarization. So really, if you're looking for gravitational waves in the early universe, you're looking uh, for this B mode signal. So, you know, models of inflation predict that the universe underwent this period of exponential expansion shortly after its beginning. There's a, you know, cartoonish version here of, of the classic kind of slow roll uh, situation. Um, but inflation is really great because it offers several explanations uh, for unanswered problems. So the expansion gives us a nearly flat, homogeneous, and isotropic universe. It seeds the density fluctuations because quantum fluctuations are blown up to cosmological scales. And it creates these tensor perturbations because the, the space is expanding so fast that we have these, these gravitational ripples. And so uh, we get the, these gravitational waves, which in turn make those B modes. Now, B modes here are really the cleanest channel to detect inflation and we quantify their amplitude with the tensor to scalar ratio R. And R is basically a direct measurement of the energy of inflation. And so we can actually uh, learn and differentiate uh, from different models of inflation. But another part of this is that you're probing basically quantum gravity and fundamental physics 10 to the negative 36 seconds after the universe began. So these are at grand unification theory energy scales. And these are scales that we can't reach with terrestrial particle accelerators. So if we come back to our plot of power versus angular scale, and now look at the polarizations, we have our E modes here and our B modes here. At these small angular scales, you're getting information about the formation of structure, which in turn is giving you information about neutrinos dark matter and dark energy. And then at these large angular scales, you're, you're trying to constrain R in these early universe theories. Um, and one thing to really note on this plot is that uh, this B mode signal is incredibly small, which means that there are a lot of challenges in measuring it. So uh, right now, the amplitude is, is less than 0.082, and so to be able to measure uh, something that small, we need to have high sensitivity. We also know that there, are, there is polarized foreground contamination from synchrotron and dust in our galaxy. So if we look at this, this plot of the polarization here, um, you can see there's the CMB. Dust is dominating at high frequencies. Synchrotron is dominating at low frequencies. But the key here is that these have different spectral shapes. So if we can measure at a bunch of frequencies, we can try to characterize and remove these signals. And then finally, uh, for ground-based experiments, fluctuations in the unpolarized atmosphere, especially on these large angular scales where we want to measure that B-mode signal, um, are, are really problematic. So the atmosphere itself is, is 5 to 20 Kelvin, and it can fluctuate by tens of millikelvin on minute time scales. And this B-mode signal we're searching for is less than 100 nanokelvin. So that's, that, those are big um, challenges that we need to overcome. And so we really have to work to lower our atmospheric noise. To do that, we go to the highest and driest places in the world, the South Pole and, and Chile. And then some experiments have also started using polarization modulators to separate the unpolarized atmosphere from this polarized signal. So really, the future progress in CMB science is now really driven by instrumental advancements. So where we've uh, moved from single, single pixels to these multi croak pixels um, that have uh, two frequencies and two polarizations per detector, and that allows you to more effectively use your focal plane area. So in the same area, you get double the detectors. Uh, we're increasing our pixel count to increase our sensitivity. We're doing that by increasing the number of pixels per array, so making these really tight-packed arrays, but also increasing the number of arrays total. 
Um, we've also started using improved broadband optics to increase our sensitivity and frequency coverage. And uh, some experiments, uh, like Simon's Observatory, have started using uh, polarization modulators. These allow you to modulate the incoming polarization and separate it from these unpolarized fluctuations in the atmosphere. But uh, as with most things, sensitivity is not sufficient by itself. Uh, the science achievable with these future experiments like SO and CMBS4 is really going to depend on how well we can model and mitigate systematic effects and how well we ca can calibrate our telescopes. So, you know, with this unmatched sensitivity comes more susceptibility to systematic effects. If you had uh, a systematic that was below your noise floor before and then your noise floor goes down, suddenly the systematic that, that you could neglect before becomes incredibly important. And so um, we really need improved simulations of systematics to inform the instrument design and its removal and analysis. And we need improved calibration so we can characterize our instrument and help mitigate these systematic effects. So uh, Simon's Observatory as I said, is this the stepping stone to these next generation experiments. Uh, we're located at an elevation of 5,200 meters in the Atacama Desert in Chile. We have three um, flavors of multi crow cameras. We have 2739 for the synchrotron, uh, 9150 gigahertz for our main science channels, and then our, our just channels at 220, 280 gigahertz. And we have over 60,000 detectors in the nominal configuration. So we have two types of telescopes that we'll deploy on Simon's Observatory. So we have these small aperture telescopes, and there are three half meter refractive telescopes. You can see uh, a picture of the platform here. And these are really focusing on measuring and constraining that B mode signal. So they're they are focused on um, those large angular scales. We also have a large aperture telescope, or LAT, um, which is a six meter cross dragoni design with seven optics tubes populated. And this is really going after that high resolution, small angular scale science. So dark matter, dark energy, and neutrinos, um, particles beyond the standard model. So uh, looking at the, the optics design, this is a cross section of the large aperture telescope. Light goes through here, hits the primary, hits the secondary, and goes into uh, our camera. And you can see there are uh, 13 optics tubes here. In the first iteration of SO, we'll be populating seven of those. Light goes in, uh, gets focused by lenses onto our detector array. So this is a six meter cross dragoni that gives us a 1.4 arc minute beam at 150 gigahertz. And we have a total field of view of 7.8 degrees on the sky. For the small aperture telescopes, it's a fully refractive design, so we're just using three lenses to focus the light onto the detector arrays. And this one has a much larger beam because it's looking at those large angular scales. So it's a 17 arc minute beam at 150 gigahertz, the field of view of 35 degrees. And one of the key features that SO is implementing is uh, polarization modulation through a continuously rotating half-wave plate. And uh, the Atacama B-Mode Search, or ABS, really pioneered half-wave plates for ground-based CMB experiments. This is a project I worked on as a graduate student. But the polarization modulation mitigates atmospheric noise. It also reduces systematic effects and instrumental polarization leakage, because if you have any spurious polarization signals in here, they don't get modulated. It can also be used uh, to calibrate and characterize the instrument as well. So after we go through our optics, we focus onto our detector arrays. The majority of the SO arrays are feed horn coupled arrays. So uh, you have this metal feed horn, which defines your detector beam. It couples light onto this ortho mode transducer on the detector. And this is basically just four fins where light is coupling in the direction of the fins. So you split the light into two orthogonal polarizations. From there, it travels into our detectors, where it goes through, where it splits into two different frequencies, 
based on our on-band filters. And then we dump that power onto the detectors here. So there are four detectors per pixel, two for each of the polarizations and two for each of the bands. Um, we're using, as our detectors, transition edge sensors, which use the really steep superconducting to normal transition of a superconductor to make a very sensitive detector. And these operate at 160 millikelvin. Uh, we're reading them out with a relatively new technology in the field, this microwave MUX. Uh, here you can read out 1,000 detectors per line versus uh, the previous best with time domain multiplexing of 64. But we don't only have to design these experiments, we actually have to produce them. So here is a, an image showing how we're scaling up. So uh, Advanced Act just finished observing in the field. It was a current generation experiment. It had five, uh, four 150 millimeter detector arrays. And so Nominal will scale that up to 49. And CMBS4 will scale that up to about 500. So we're jumping by orders of magnitude every few years here. Um, so really scalability and production rate and cost are going to be absolutely necessary to build these next generation experiments. And one area uh, that I've developed uh, to help us with that is in the feed horn array production. So the, those pieces that are coupling light onto the detectors. So we used to have to individually pattern individual silicon wafers um, with photolithography and stack up about 40 of them to make these feed horn profiles. Um, with that, it's great. You can make many different feed horn geometries, but it took several weeks to produce a single array. And when you're making 500 of these, that's just not, not feasible. And so it's time and cost prohibitive for next generation experiments. So uh, what I've spent a lot of time working on is developing uh, machining profiles into metal with just a custom drill and reamer set. And so with this, you can do about five arrays per week. It takes only about seven hours to machine uh, this whole array. And that's about 1 20th the time and cost. So you can do this commercially. You can spread it between many machine shops. And Illumina is really cost effective and easy to machine. And so you can see down here a cross section of this feed horn array. So this is the, the profiled shape. Um, you can see a full uh, machined array here. And then we are able to validate these with beam maps and metrology to make sure that they have the design performance. And so you can see uh, a map of that beam here showing that the red curve matches the red curve and the blue curve matches the blue curve. But we don't need, only need advances in technology. We also need advances in modeling just as, as much as we need advances in technology. So uh, the team that I've worked with on SO has developed an, an instrument sensitivity calculate, calculator to, to estimate the noise. That has been adopted by CMBS4 as well. Um, and we've also developed an end-to-end -end experimental model that feeds into science forecasts, um, gives feedback on the instrument design, and helps set requirements on systematic effects and calibration. And in addition, this is really building up the analysis pipeline so that when we get data, we can analyze it much more rapidly. And here there's just a really important interplay between sensitivity, systematics, and calibration that's critically important. And so we really have to consider this balance for all aspects of the instrument. So let's go back to this example of feed horns. So uh, typically in a feed horn, you want to have high beam coupling efficiency. So you want to have really good sensitivity. For your systematic effects, you want to have uh, maximal beam symmetry, because asymmetry can lead to, to temperature to polarization leakage, and E mode to B mode leakage. And so you kind of have to trade off between these two. Uh, you, you're kind of stuck somewhere on this line. Now, with calibration of your beam, uh, using planet observations and external calibrators, you can reduce the beam systematic effects by a factor of about uh, 10%, so that, that's gaining you a little bit. But if we look at that previous state of the art, there's not much flexibility. So there were these conical feed horns, which have high coupling efficiency, 
but poor beam symmetry, so they end up up here. And then there are these corrugated feed horns. Uh, these have to be fabricated out of silicon. They're very difficult to machine because you have to triple etch the silicon to get these uh, reentrant features. And here you have near ideal beam symmetry, but really low coupling efficiency because these corrugations depend on the wavelength of light that you're looking at. So they're always going to be the same size and they're just eating into your aperture. So the axpole feed horn um, was seven millimeters wide. The aperture size requirement for Simon's Observatory is 5.15. And so if you tried to squish this into this footprint, you're just eating up a lot of your efficiency. And so your corrugated feed horns put you down here at low efficiency, uh, low systematic effects. But what I uh, developed was this new state-of-the-art spline-profiled feed horns. So these really give you tunability between beam symmetry and efficiency. So you actually get a pick where you want to be on this line for your specific experiment. Um, these have been used on advanced act pole, Toltec, SO, and their baseline for CMBS4. Um, and they increased advanced act mapping speed by a factor of 1.8 our, in our main science bands compared to that corrugated design I showed you. Um, we designed them to have a monotonically increasing profile as well, which enables that direct machining while giving you high performance. So you can both have your performance and your production. And if we can simulate uh, the systematics of this to check that it's okay, uh, we can look at our, our average leakage beams for the, the simulated feed horn performance and turn those into a leakage in the power spectra. And you can see here that the systematics ended up being acceptable uh, once we accounted for calibration. And so we were able to gain uh, and optimize to get 10% more in our sensitivity. And you know, we don't only need this for feed horns, we need this level of rigor for every aspect of the project. And so this is really an effort that I've been spearheading. Um, we need it for instrument design decisions, do our instrument designs really meet our requirements? What design changes are gonna be the most important and impactful? Um, what's our calibration plan? What, what are our calibration requirements? How often do we have to calibrate? Um, is the calibration hardware we have now actually sufficient to meet these new stringent requirements? And you know, the short answer is sometimes, and sometimes not. So I've been working to actually develop uh, new calibration systems as well. So uh, Simon's Observatory is currently fielding. Uh, we're gonna be doing really groundbreaking uh, science. You can see uh, them installing the Small Aperture Telescope, which was installed uh, about two months ago. We actually just saw the moon last week during commissioning, so uh, we're, we're starting to get on the sky. Uh, and we're really laying the groundwork for CMBS4 in future CMB projects. We're developing these technologies with improved performance that can be fabricated at scale, we're developing new tools for instrument modeling and analysis pipelines. And we're really digging into this balance between sensitivity, systematic effects, and calibration. So for our survey strategy, um, the nominal SO will observe five years beginning uh, this year. Uh, so the small aperture telescopes are going to be focused on a small 10% of the sky to really drill down deep and try and measure that B mode signal from inflation. And then our large aperture telescopes will be getting high angular resolution over large areas of the sky. So we'll be observing about 40% of the sky. And uh, if we look at kind of some of the improvements we expect from, from experiments like CMBS4, uh, the improvement is just really overwhelming. So if you look here, we have current generation experiments on here. And you can see that the, the error bars from the CMBS4 forecasts can barely even be seen. So this is just really uh, going to be a huge boon um, for CMB science. And if we look at what effect that has on the science forecast, um, you can see our current best estimates here. And we're improving by at least an order of magnitude or more uh, when we look at the performance of CMBS4. Additionally, uh, outside of just these parameters, SO is gonna measure about 20,000 galaxy clusters, and CMBS4 will measure over 100,000 uh, galaxy clusters.
So this will be really huge leaps in our scientific understanding. But as I said, um, all this technology and all this work doesn't only impact CMB-specific experiments. It also is a boon to the microwave uh, observatories that, that are being built as well. So uh, one example of this is Toltec. So this is a high-resolution SZ camera for the large millime millimeter telescope in Mexico. So this has a, a 50-meter dish, so we actually get 5 to 10 arc-second resolution and those advantages over X-ray that I mentioned before. And this is really using a lot of these CMB technologies. For example, it's using uh, the, those feed horns. And this is really going to take us from handfolds to hundreds of high-resolution individual SC cluster observations. Uh, with this resolution, we're actually able to resolve substructure. And that allows us to reduce uncertainties from astrophysical processes uh, that are limiting our cluster cosmology. Um, so we had our first light in, in 2022, and we're going to uh, com complete commissioning this fall and then go into our observing program. And there are several open surveys to the community on Toltec. So I just want to advertise that in the next few years, if you're interested in high resolution uh, high resolution observations in the millimeter regime, um, there will be several open surveys that you can apply for time on. And Toltec is just really a unique opportunity to open a new discovery space in cluster astrophysics and really improve our understanding of dark energy and dark matter. So um, just to wrap up, the next generation of CMB observations are really poised to make tremendous discoveries. We'll be able to observe gravity operating on quantum scales, probe particles beyond the standard model, constrained masses of neutrinos, and get new insights in the dark energy, dark matter, and structure formation. And really, Simon's Observatory, Toltec, and CMBS4 are really going to be on the forefront of these next generation observations. Um, they require advances in technology, production, and understanding our instruments. But if we're able to do this, uh, measurements with these experiments will really give us the best opportunity to further our understanding of the fundamental physics of the universe. So I'll stop there. And Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so we have time for questions. Um, am I understanding the half wave plate polarization module, uh, modulation as lock in amplification? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, essentially, yes. I mean, what's, what was confusing to me about that was I thought you were saying that a lot of the noise is coming from basically the signal source going through the sky. So how, weren't you modulating it like at the detector? How does that help you? Yeah, so a lot of the, the noise that we see is unpolarized. So it's unpolarized fluctuations in the atmosphere. And we're taking the celestial polarization signal and, and modulating that. So we're only looking at the modulated signal. So we don't look at any of that unpolarized noise. I'm sorry, this might be a really naive... Oh. Hello? Um, sorry, this might be a naive question, but the one graph that you showed twice, what does multipole number L mean on the x-axis? Yeah, so that's basically the angular size scale on the sky. So we take the sky and decompose it into spherical harmonics, so those YL limbs, uh, that you've maybe seen in quantum. Um, and basically, those are those multipoles um, that we use there. And so large multipoles are small angular scales, and small multipoles are large angular scales. Thank you. Any other questions? Does the, uh, does the S4 cons uh, proposed constraint for the sum of the neutrino masses, does that include a tau prior? Or is that just tau from S4 itself, or, yeah? Yeah, so that, that one includes a, a pretty conservative tau prior, but we do expect um, improved measurements in the, in the next few years um, from things like class um, and, and other experiments. So uh, the CMBS4 science paper has, has all of those tau priors broken down if you want to see them in, in more detail. Anybody else?
Go ahead. You can I'll go ahead and ask another one. Another one. That. <laughs> that, so that microwave feed horn technology, um, that, that seems like a super cool innovation, but also something someone would have come up with in like, you know, a long time ago if that was in a band that was useful to technologies. You know, like you think about the two gigahertz range, I assume all possible impedance matching devices exist because of cell phones and stuff. Is this in a range that nobody cares about otherwise? Is that, are you having to do a lot of like low level RF engineering because of that or? Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is, is you know, we need it more than, like the very lowest frequencies, there's like telecommunications, but at these like higher frequencies, um, there's not as much development. And so there's, there's not as many commercial applications. And so we've had to do all of this uh, from, from scratch ourselves. Mm. Higher frequencies are smaller features and has to be mass produced. So way, there's probably, they've probably made more horns than they've ever been. Cool. <laughs> Close to it. Like a two gigahertz one like this. I'm, I'm interested in the custom fee horn. Can you talk a little bit more about the, how to machine those fee horn and how to make the custom tool to do the fee horn? Sorry, I could couldn't quite hear your question. Can you go a little closer? Oh, to I'm interested in that fee horn array uh, with the spine profile. Can you talk a little bit more about the machining process of that? Yeah, so uh, really uh, what we do is just buy um, a custom drill and reamer. And so you drill out most of the material, you do like a roughing drill, and then you do a finishing reamer and you go in and drill it with that. But the, the profile of that matches this designed profile. And then to get that designed profile, we actually have to do uh, simulations of, of feed horn performance and optimize with an MCMC um, to get these kind of spline profiled shapes. Okay, so you're saying the drill bit, it's in the, sh the same shape in the... Yeah. Okay. There's very few uh, tooling vendors who will actually make something like this. <laughs> That's Trina. one of the challenges. Yeah, uh, thanks, Hera. Uh, can you say if, uh, if the limit on tensor to scalar ratio for SO, is that uh, d lensing nice limited, or is it foregrounds? Sorry, what was that? Uh, the limit on tensor to scalar ratio? Yeah. Uh, or the error bar? Is, yeah. that, is that dominated by d lensing or? Uh... Um, yeah, so uh, we basically have uh, on CMBS4 a, a lat that does the d lensing to do a d lensing survey. So it looks over the same area. Um, and so mainly the, the limitation there ends up being the, the sensitivity, how many detectors we have on the sky. All right, any other questions? Okay, so I actually, I have one. So uh, you were measuring, uh, measure, mentioning uh, the LMT on Toltec, mm -hmm. right? Uh, do you know anything about, uh, this is supposed to be probably, it's around 150 because it's meant to find SC clusters, even if it's kind of like a targeted telescope, kind of like Mustang, Mustang 2, or is it doing like a survey of SC galaxies? Anything yeah, that you so can tell us about? Yeah, so it's 150, 220, 270. Um, and clusters is only a small portion of what it does. So it has these, these large legacy surveys. Um, they'll be observing, you know, larger patches of the sky for those. Some things will be targeting, you know, galactic clouds um, for, for star formation. Um, there's a lot of different, different legacy surveys and applications, so it's much more open. Um, I, if I remember correctly, there are about 10 legacy surveys of, um, you know, 100 hours each that are available on the LMT for this, and only four of them are currently populated, and so the rest will really uh, be driven by community input. But it's, uh, but it's not a CMB machine, it's basically like an astrophysics yeah. program. Yes, okay. exactly. All right. Well, you know the question, please. Uh, what do we think, uh, Sarah? Again, thank you. <laughs>